This week on Quadriga, a German Europe or a European Germany? Europe is facing unprecedented challenges. The financial crisis, the refugee crisis, and the Ukraine crisis. To address those demands, Europe needs leadership. Some are looking to Germany. Others, though, are worried that Berlin is becoming too powerful. Nobody wants Germany to go it alone. If Germany gets too strong, it will be isolated. But if it's not strong enough, it can't lead. What lies ahead for Europe and its ideals of peace and prosperity? Coming to you from Berlin, Quadriga, the international debate. Your host this week, Peter Craven. Yes, hello and a very warm welcome to this latest edition of Quadriga coming to you from the heart of the German capital, Berlin. And as, of you, as you've already heard, uh, the question that we're asking on today's show is a German Europe or a European Germany? It's a big question indeed. And it's all part of a week of special programming we're doing here on Deutsche Welle, uh, focusing on the future of Europe, asking big questions about the future of Europe. Where will Europe go next? Now, to talk about all this and much, much more, I hope I'm joined here in the studio by three uh, keen and seasoned observers and analysts. Let me introduce them to you without any further ado. Beginning with Judy Dempsey, a writer and analyst for the Carnegie Foundation, who in a long and distinguished career has also worked with a host of international broadcasters. Judy asks the following, where and what is Europe without Germany? Without Angela Merkel, Europe would be weakened even further. Also with us is Anglo-German writer and journalist Alan Posner, who's a regular commentator for the Berlin-based daily Die Welt. Konrad Adenauer and Helmut Kohl knew, says Alan, that Germany must never be perceived as a European hegemon. Angela Merkel has forgotten that lesson, and as a result, he says, Europe is falling apart. Strong stuff. And it's nice to welcome back Ursula Weidenfeld, who has worked for a whole range of Germany's most prestigious business publications as an editor, an author, and a prize-winning commentator. Ursula says if people want Germany to exercise power, then they shouldn't grumble when Germany does. <laughs> okay, I'd like to begin with you, Judy, Judy Dempsey. Uh, today's debate, as you may or may not know, is based on a quote from Thomas Mann. It goes back to the post-war period. I think it was 1953. And the Nobel Prize winning author said at that time that people here in this country, Germany, should try and create not a German Europe, but a European Germany. Was he right? That's a long time ago, <laughs> and a lot has changed. And um, I think, uh, looking back, Germany became European in terms of, through the European Union, by the way, through the, uh, the development of the European, um, coal, uh, the European Union. And so, uh, what I mean by that is that the democratic institutions became absolutely embedded. The whole idea of transparency, of, of federalism, of accountability, of, of, of the separation of powers, it became embedded in Germany. That's a huge success. In that sense, Germany became European, in, in, a, in a sense that we can understand the term. For, uh, but, but to take up Mann's other point, you know, European, the European, the Germanization of Europe, no. I mean, this, this, should not happen, mm. and actually it cannot happen. Mm. All this, trying to get your Germany integrated into a European superstructure, came out of the fear. You said it was a long time ago, but it was this was the post-Second World War yes. period. That it was a terrible century, and Germany played a terrible role in the last century. People were clearly fearful of Germany. Should they be fearful of today's Germany, Alan? But it depends what you mean by fearful, not in the way they were fearful of Germany in the Third Reich. All talk of a new Fourth Reich is, um, I won't say the word, is, is nonsense. Um, <laughs> but honestly, it's nonsense. But I do think there is a danger that Germany is getting too big for its boots and that it's trying to create, at least in the Eurozone, a Europe according to its own, a, a Germanized core Europe. And, and this isn't working. Uh, we've seen it in Greece, we've seen it, seeing it all over the Mediterranean countries. People are protesting against the use of the euro as a, as a, uh, to create Europe in Germany's image. And this is, this, though people won't say it uh, out loud unless they're demonstrating, I think this has alienated a whole lot of people uh, in Europe and will alienate them further. What's, what's wrong with creating Europe in Germany's image if, as Judy has just explained, Germany is, is a model of modern democracy, a country of great prosperity, a progressive country? 
What's wrong with Europe uh, being cast in that mould? There's nothing wrong with being progressive and modern and democratic, though Germany's not in a position to lecture anyone else on that subject. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that there's cultural differences, there's economic difficulties, uh, differences which have to do with culture. You simply cannot transform... I mean, you can't even transform all of Germany into what southern Germany is at the moment. Look at Berlin, look at, look at Saxony... Well, no, look at, look at Brandenburg, look at, look at the eastern federal states of Germany. They're not performing the way... Southern Germany is performing, and you can't get uh, Southern Europe to perform, to perform the way West Germany is performing. It's not going to work. It's just going to create more friction. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. The British journalist uh, recently called Germany. I don't know how I, I don't know how long ago it was, but I remember that I, that it lodged in my mind's eye. Uh, Ursula, he called uh, Timothy Garton Ash yeah. called Germany the best Germany we've ever had. Mm. Yeah. Not saying, Germ much. <laughs> <laughs> not saying much, says Alan Posner. Yeah. <laughs> if this is the best Germany we've ever had. <laughs> Why should people be frightened of German power or German soft power? I think people shouldn't be frightened about German's power and even not about Germany's soft power because Germany isn't, isn't using that. I think Germany is um, a country which tries, not always in a lucky way, not always in a charming way, not always in, in, a, in an amazing way, to, um, to be European, to be a good European. And I think... Um, it is becoming better in that. But the good European bullied Greece recently. Well, I, I, I don't agree because um, I, I, I don't think that it was German, Germans bullying Greece. It was um, just trying to, um, to hold Greece within the Eurozone. It was just trying to make them, uh, them um, obey the rules which are, which are written down. And it was trying to make all the others to be ready to pay for Greece once more. Judy is shaking a fist at you almost. <laughs> <laughs> this, this question of, of bullying, I completely disagree with this. Firstly, many countries stood behind Germany or hid behind Germany and they led Wolfgang Schäuble, the German foreign minister, sometimes Merkel, Merkel was often very quiet, to do the hard, to do the hard work. Fundamentally, this Euro we have to define this Europeanisation. This Europeanisation is not about uh, making a monolithic culture. This Europeanisation is about dealing with globalisation and making Europe competitive. This is what the Euro crisis is about. There are several countries in the Eurozone that should never have joined the Euro, and one of them is Greece. And Germany was pushed into doing this for many, many reasons. So when we talk about the Europeanisation, Schäuble and Merkel, Merkel sees it differently, but Schäuble sees it as Europe being prepared. And nobody is naive enough to believe that Germany can go along with this huge, uh, unknown, uh, we haven't seen the, 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 even the real beginning of globalisation and how, how it's going to affect European values, let alone the transatlantic relationship. This is, this, is the, this is the crux of the issue, how to keep the rules together to make Europe competitive. But look, if, if this is about globalisation, if the euro is about globalisation, how come you have in the eurozone the worst growth of any you yes. take the OECD yes. countries, yes. you take Britain, you take the yes. United States, yes. Um, yes. and they've got a much better growth rate yes. than the, Euro the Eurozone. Yes. If they didn't have Germany yes. with, I don't know, measly 0.5% yes. growth, yes. they'd be in recession. This is, this is a great point, Alan, because it validates the reason why Europe needs to be competitive. You have antiquated structures in France. No wonder France was against the, the big reform uh, package for Greece because it would show up how France isn't doing any reforms. And we have seen, it's very interesting, everybody used to praise Finland, a great model of modernity, modernization. And what happened? They were sleeping over Nokia, who employed thousands and thousands of people. They were sleeping because they thought they could get away with it and not be impacted by globalization, meaning I don't want to advertise any American Silicon Valley phones. Oh, yeah. And so they, they sold off most of their stuff, except for one branch to, guess what, the German Siemens. So they were caught napping. And in some ways, the Eurozone crisis is, is, um, is a symptom of this sleeping. Let's talk about Germany again. Alan made a very important point. You were talking about this, this, this charge that you made that, uh, that Germany is working to establish the euro as a, as a sphere of influence, as a, as a zone of influence, as its own backyard. And the man who personifies that more than any other is the German finance minister, Wolfgang Schäuble. We're going to have a look at some pictures now because, as we, uh, as we will see, the mood around Mr Schäuble can get pretty ugly. 
Southern Europeans have turned him into a bogeyman. Finance Minister Wolfgang Schäuble is viewed there as a taskmaster who wants to force the rest of Europe to adopt German ideals about fiscal discipline, economizing, and the benefits of being industrious. Schäuble and his vision for Europe came out on top in a tough marathon of negotiations, but he didn't make many friends doing it, and he angered important partners France and Italy in the process. Until now, compromise has been a key aspect of diplomacy in Brussels. Has Germany's uncompromising finance minister harmed the European idea? There's at least two people shaking their heads here already. Uh, Ursula Weidenfeld, Wolf <laughs> Wolfgang Schäuble comes from the, the lovely town of Freiburg down in Germany's southwest, in Baden-Württemberg. What does that tell us about him? I think he is um, probably the last real European in the, in the German government. And the last he... real European in the German government has been accused of beating up other countries. I think that this is wrong. It's completely wrong. It, what he does is um, the fight for just saving Europe, saving the Eurozone, uh, in order to make Europe stronger and to to uh, to, to make Europe safe uh, from from being destroyed by 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 economic differences, by financial differences, and things like that. Yanis Varoufakis, the former Greek finance minister, controversial figure himself, of course, has said the Schäuble <laughs> line is the Eurogroup line. They have to tow the Schäuble line. He's gone further than that. He said, there is no doubt in my mind that Wolfgang Schäuble views the Eurogroup, that's the informal meeting of the Eurozone finance ministers, just to explain it, he views the Eurogroup as his own playground. Well, that is an impression I would have too if I have been the Greek finance minister in, in, the, last, uh, in the last month. So uh, the Greek had um, different views on Europe, on the Eurozone, because they had to agree to reforms because they had to apply for more, more money and they're, they're, they had at least accept the conditions. Mm. What is wrong, Judy, about Germany insisting on fiscal probity and strict budgetary practice not, around was, and austerity was, was, around was, Europe. It was what not is only wrong? Germany, it was Northern Europe as a whole. No, and even more, which is interesting. And the Greek foreign minister, I mean, he, he perhaps used his power as a little playground as well with his fancy motorbike. But um, just look at the countries that supported Germany. Slovakia went through austerity. Baltic the Baltic states. states. Ireland, which is now turning, turning uh, into this positive figures. Spain and Portugal. Spain and Portugal particularly told Schäuble, don't weaken. We've gone through the austerity measures. It'll pay off. Yes, the short term is absolutely miserable, but if you give in to Greece, what will our publics think? That was a waste of effort. So, I mean, there was, there was many in the Eurogroup uh, of countries that actually supported Germany on this. And to answer your question, mm. it, yes, the measures are very, very tough, but they were long overdue. Mm. Well, it, 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 is, it is a good point that you're making there that many members of the Eurogroup did view Germany as their champion and yes. they sort of stood behind Germany in Germany's shadow. Nevertheless, uh, Alan, I was, a, you know, I, I, I was fascinated to read the, uh, the leading British Tory, uh, the London Mayor Boris Johnson, saying the following, uh, that, uh, that Wolfgang Schäuble, the German finance minister, is now the man with a gun in his hand. He puts the gun to the head of the other Eurozone members. Is that the way you see it? I wish it hadn't been Boris Johnson uh, who said that. A man who changes his opinion, his opinions uh, more often probably than he does his um, underwear. But uh, uh, he's still right, you know. And and the fact that 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 the, that, that other countries sort of push Germany to the fore uh, doesn't make it any better. Um, the problem and and also the fact that Wolfgang Schäuble is a true believer doesn't make it any better. He honestly thinks you can create a viable European Union by pushing incompatible economies together. And it's not going to work. It hasn't worked. It has destroyed so much trust, so much uh, uh, within Europe. And it has alienated countries like Poland, like, uh, like Britain, um, uh, who are out of the Euro, who are now very, you know, no matter the Poles make all sorts of friendly uh, noises, but they are scared. The Poles are looking to the United States, the British are looking to the United States. So the true believer, it's a tragic almost tragic, the true believer of Wolfgang Schäuble is actually destroying Europe. Just before Judy comes in, because I know she wants to, is it therefore, is, must the next step for the German government be to get Wolfgang Schäuble out of the picture because he has become a liability in European relations? Well, he's so old, he's going to be, I mean, he's going to be out of the picture in a year or two anyway. That I, 
it's, it's um, and God, goodness knows who's going <laughs> who's going to come after him. It's it's necessary for the German government to develop a new vision for Europe, which is more inclusive, which um, which. which but, but why has it to be the, the German government? It is. It, it, well, it's, well, a stra it's, a it's a strange image which which you create. Yeah, here. I, I wish it were Britain, quite frankly, uh, but. David Cameron seems to be mm. totally disinterested mm. in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, who is there? Yeah, this is the big problem. I mean, Germany is leading because the other great nations of Europe uh, can't lead, surely. The well, Brits don't want to, the French... Well, the French can't. It's, um, it's, <laughs> it's very... It, it's terribly complicated because the whole idea of Europe and its future is now becoming so ideological and polarised. And probably this is the first time for a long, long time, in fact, for uh, forever perhaps, that the whole idea of Europe and Europeanness has been questioned. Now, it does uh, behove Germany to actually lead this discussion. And Chancellor Angela Merkel doesn't lead this discussion. We have two chancellors in Germany. We have the German chancellor, who looks after the, the Ukraine issue particularly, and we have, the, 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 in a British sense, the other chancellor, uh, Schäuble, who actually wants to push Europe uh, forward. Not, Alan, on, on Germany's, uh, in Germany's like this. It's impossible, I agree. But Wolfgang Schäuble knows that the logical step, the inexorable logic of this Euro crisis has to be more integration. And somehow it's, it's, it's a bit of a taboo word, but it's out there among the elites. Because he knows that nobody will agree to that. The Britons won't, um, the French won't, the Greek won't. Uh, so there, there will be... If, if, if you have to change the European treaties, mm, yes. um, you, you, you won't be successful. And that knows Wolfgang Schäuble, and therefore he has to try to find ways around, in between, and doing things like that. Can I just say one point? This? Um, but this is this is intellectual laziness on the part of the leaders. Yes. Now, well, it's just, it is no, 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 no. It's something else. It's something else. They, there's, there's this idea. Well, we can't, we can't raise the issue. We have to discuss this issue for two fundamental reasons. One is I mentioned the globalization, but secondly, we have the faltering of the transatlantic relationship. Yes. And we have the other side of the Atlantic, the United States saying to Europe, you get your act together, you do the burden sharing, you get your Eurozone together, stop leaning on Uncle Sam. That's the, that's the change and that's what leaders in Europe should respond to. Give me one word, each of you, maybe two, but one, <laughs> if you can, for what Europe, the EU, stands for today. Humanity. Diversity. Judy Dempsey, after deep thought. <laughs> um, uh, uh, unfulfilled wishes. OK, humanity, <laughs> diversity, unfulfilled wishes. Here is more on the same question. Since it was founded, the European Union has stood for peace, prosperity and shared values like human rights. The Schengen Agreement, signed in 1990, led to open borders and the free movement of goods and people. The EU, practically every country on the continent, wanted to be a member. Especially in Eastern Europe, where nations could hardly wait to join the Union and later the Eurozone. But now the bloc faces major problems. The financial crisis, the Greek debt crisis, a huge surge in the number of migrants trying to get in, and more and more countries are now distancing themselves from European values, like Britain and Hungary. For many, the EU now stands mostly for bureaucracy, a callous attitude towards those in need, and a mountain of debt. Can Europe be saved? Big questions. Uh, what most people agree is that Europe needs a new narrative. How could the new narrative look? Alan Posner. Well, I agree with Judy on this. We we need to to in in a time of um, relative American decline, the the rise of other powers um, uh, uh, such as India and China, and 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 a uh, uh, very aggressive Russian Russia to the east. Uh, we need to get our act together. We need to develop power in every respect, economic, political, and military. And one of the points about this 
disastrous Euro crisis has been, it hasn't led to Europe developing any of these. It has led to us neglecting the European issue. It's been dealt That's with right. uh, sort of on the side. It's led to um, Europe not, you know, the, 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 you, you could say that Europe basically is um, Germany, France, Britain and, and Poland with a sort of satellite of, and, and these four are not working together. Mm -hmm. So this is what needs to happen. Um, because we we def and, and I'm talking about the transatlantic trade, for instance, we need to get TTIP yes. uh, done so that we can, together with the Americans, establish our Western values. They're not just purely European values um, in the world of tomorrow. So I'm absolutely pro-European, which is why I've, I'm so anti-Euro, right? <laughs> yes. Rosalind, is that a narrative that you share for the future of your European Union, the one you live in? Yes, I would share that, but um, I doubt that um, the majority of the Europeans would share that. So yeah. um, they are not so much interested in foreign policy, they are not so, so much interested in military things. They are interested in econ economy, economy, in wealth, in uh, living in peace and, and without and, and travelling freely f uh, through Europe. So I think um, one of the narratives or the only narrative Europe can develop and has developed and has to stick with this are to be the, 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 the continent of humanity, of the, to stand for human dignity, to be fair to refugees and to, for, for, to, to people who, who, are, um, who, who suffer in their homelands. And, and that is, that is the, the, the big issue for, for Europe for the, for the upcoming years. And that is the issue you, Europe has to connect its values with. It's an attractive vision, whether, whether it's going to galvanise the mm. young people of Europe. Mm. I, I don't know. What do you say, Judy? This is a really complicated uh, question. I would say two things. The tragedy of Europe is that it's, it's, it's still, despite Islamic State, despite the southern neighbourhood, despite uh, uh, Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine, we seem still to be living in a comfort zone. Mm. that we can be insulated from this, that we can be isolated. It's over there, it's away. And the refugees finally is, is waking us up and perhaps testing your values, Ursula. The second thing, if you, if you talk about a narrative, I have one narrative, but I, 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 it's going to take such effort. It's a narrative of self-confidence. If we believe in these values, if we believe after so many years of, of wars on the continent, if we believe that we overca overcame this and created something very, very special, why don't we sell it? Why do we lack self-confidence? Because nobody would buy it. <laughs> Depends how you sell it, though. <laughs> I mean, this is all... It, it, I know that sounds very, very uh, facile or, or naive. It, it's about persuasion. It's not stuck in the institutions in Brussels or making decisions behind closed doors in the capitals. It's about town hall meetings. It's about explaining who we are, why we are, why do we have these values. And what role could Germany play in all this? Well, this is interesting. Um, uh, Chancellor Merkel has tried to do some town hall meetings. <laughs> So she has, and at least she gets out, I suppose. Germany has an enormous role in this by actually uh, creating clusters of small and big countries together. Helmut Kohl, former chancellor, was superb at this. When he wanted something done in Brussels or when he thought it was good for Europe, he'd ring up his friends, whether in Paris or, or The Hague or, or Madrid, say, listen, and the small countries. I said, listen, we've got to hatch this. If you do this, I'll do this for you. It was trade-offs, it was compromises. And actually, this, these clusters and trade-offs have to be, have to be um, uh, rediscovered. I've got one minute for Alan. Germany's role in bringing you, moving Europe forward. Engage more with Great Britain, because oh. that's your bridge to the United States. Engage more directly also with the United States. Uh, try to bring France back into the fold and don't concentrate so much on rules and regulations because that's not the way business is done. Neither the Anglo-Saxons nor the Southern Europeans do it. Concentrate on bringing Europe forward. Rosella? Concentrate on economics and make Europe just become one of the, um, the continent of, of wealth and growth. On the other hand, um, concentrate on human rights and make Europe to be the place for which is known that, that people who have to leave their countries are treated well and, 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 and are welcome in a sense of, um, of humanity. Nothing. Less state, more open, more competitive, and look after the younger generation. Mm -hmm.
give it a mistake. Yeah. Keep them here. We need them. And just one last question. I'm curious to hear from each of you whether Europe has reached and passed its high point or whether we ha we're looking forward to a still glorious future. We've passed the high point of ever closer union. That's not going to happen. And if we abandon that, we could get to a really glorious future. I agree totally. <laughs> <laughs> OK, we're going we're to have to leave it there, but I do want to... I, I, I want to share with our viewers at home one quote from a publication that I was reading when I was preparing for the show. It said, uh, clearly there is one thing worse than being dominated by Germany in the Eurozone, and that is not being dominated by Germany in the Eurozone. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>